we're going to cover six more artworks from the Africa curriculum. Most of these artworks are going to be coming from the Central Africa region, so the modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as areas like Sierra Leone and Cameroon. So our first work is the Mblo, or Portrait Mask of the Balwe people, who reside in what is now known as the Ivory Coast, which is in Western Africa. This kind of mask was a part of a performance called a gaga. So in this particular kind of performance, an individual is honored by several ritual dances and tributes, and then the mask is given to them in their honor. These masks were oftentimes commissioned by family members or admirers of the person who was being honored. This particular mask was um, supposed to be given to Moya Yansa, who is the individual represented here. Her stepson is shown here in the image holding the mask. So this image was taken around the 60s or the 70s, this is highly unusual that we have the provenance of a mask like this um, and that we actually know who the artist was and who the mask was supposed to represent. So how this works is that the mask is commissioned by admirers and then one of the people within that community of admirers will wear the honoree's clothing and the mask that is supposed to represent them and then they will conduct a dance where they are sort of mimicking the honoree's mannerisms and so on. What you'll notice when you look at this mask right here is that we we look at the person that it is supposed to represent and then we look at the mask itself and they're, they're not something that like, especially in the West, we would associate as something that is like a resemblance. So this is a really important image in terms of communicating that when artwork is intended to be portraiture, it doesn't necessarily have to have a physical resemblance to the person that it is depicting. And this is a common trend that we see in African art. Rather, there is a focus on a spiritual resemblance or an idealized resemblance rather than a true likeness. So um, a couple of common trends that we see with these kinds of masks is a very broad forehead, um, thin nose, um, slitted eyes. A lot of times the masks are very highly polished to emulate kind of like a healthy, warm glow to the skin. You will also oftentimes see um, different design motifs that are incised on the surface. So in this particular case, we have these three triangles, which are very reflective, and they kind of would have added to the, the healthy glow of the skin, so to speak. There's also these age lines around the nose and mouth. Um, so age is oftentimes associated with wisdom in a lot of these kinds of cultures, um, as is the um, sort of beard-like motif going around the chin of the figure. So even in images like this that are intended to depict women, um, beards are sometimes used to show that women can achieve a similar kind of like aged, learned status to men in some cases. We will also see this in Bundu masks in some cases. One of the most kind of telltale signs of a portrait mask are these horn-like protrusions on the top of the head. These are one of the more abstract elements of portrait masks, um, but they are seen quite often. There have been some affiliations of these um, sort of protrusions to crowns or headdresses or even hairstyles. Um, some have also likened them to animal horns. A couple of other features of the face that you should notice um, are these slitted eyes um, and this kind of like broad forehead. Oftentimes we'll see hierarchically large heads or large foreheads in African art that typically denotes wisdom because the head is the seat of knowledge. Oftentimes eyes will be closed or semi-closed. This is oftentimes associated with modesty or keeping one's eyes away from evil. There's also a very quiet, introspective look to these faces. It's a representation of an ideal beauty and an ideal morality, where a person is not phased by the conflict in the world around them. They've achieved a sense of peace. Um, so this is very similar, for example, to the Ndop portrait figure that we saw in the last lecture. So this is one of the few African arts that involves the creation of a portrait of a non-royal person. Our next work is a pool or female mask from the Chakwe peoples. 
most African societies that you've seen thus far reserve masks for men. Um, they might depict women, but in most cases, even masks that are intended to depict women are worn by men. So this is one such example where you have a mask of a female figure that would be worn by a man. So in this particular sort of ritual dance, um, a male dancer will don this mask and then they will also don women's clothes and they will dance and move in the way that they perceive women are supposed to move. Um, these sorts of dances were intended to honor Po, the female deity, and these Dances took many different forms. So there were some dances that were accompanied by the male figure, Chihongo, um, and these dances where you have the male and the female together were intended to bring fertility and prosperity into the community. These kinds of dances were also intended to honor female ancestors. The Chakwe are a matrilineal society, so ancestry is traced through the mother. So um, women are seen as occupying a very important role in society. These kinds of ceremonies were also intended to celebrate women within society that had successfully given birth and who had thus fulfilled an essential duty of their existence. Um, most of these masks are made with a wood um, as the base and then use these braided fibers for hair. A lot of the hairstyles that you'll see represented on these kinds of masks were very trendy at the time that they were created. Um, and they were also very realistic. So you can imagine that a person would be watching this dance and they would see this figure with these idealized features and this idealized hairstyle and they would see it as a, an ideal to aspire to. In terms of fe facial features that are linked to beauty, we have these very enlarged eye sockets um, that are outlined with white right here to, um, to emphasize contrast. And then the eyes, very much like we saw in the portrait mask, are slits. Again, these kind of like semi-closed or slitted eyes are associated with modesty. Another feature that we see in this mask in particular are these scarification marks around the eyes and then underneath them as well. It's not as easy to see in this image. Um, scarification is common in a lot of the cultures that we've covered. Um, in this particular case, there are a couple of marks that are below the eyes that are supposed to symbolize tears. This is affiliated with another one of the purposes of these masks, which is for use in coming of age ceremonies. So the tears are associated with kind of like the, the bittersweetness of a mother watching her children go up. They're proud of their children for, for growing up and for becoming their own people, but at the same time, they're sad to lose that intimate bond between mother and child. So like many other forms of art that we have seen in this unit, a lot of times the art is not considered as having significance or meaning when it is not in use. So when the mask is not in use, it is oftentimes discarded. Um, sometimes dancers who have worn the masks in life are buried with them in death as well. Our third work right here is a, called a Bundu helmet mask. I put the word helmet in there because this isn't a mask that is worn over the face, rather it is worn on the top of the head. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see that represented in this image right here, um, but these um, young women right here who are wearing these helmet masks are actually wearing them on top of the head. They're around the height of these women in the foreground here. So these are the only known African masks that are worn exclusively by women. Um, and they are worn by adolescent girls during the ceremony that celebrates their adulthood. Um, so the girls in the ceremony are dressed as this um, deity known as Sowe, who is a water spirit. Um, so the um, image on the top of the helmet is meant to represent like the head of this goddess. And then when you look at some images of these masks, when they don't have this kind of fringe on the bottom, they actually have these little holes or perforations where in a lot of cases that um, additional dressing has been removed. So this part of the mask is supposed to seamlessly integrate with this sort of raffia body, which is obscuring the, um, the figure of the, of the young woman underneath. The overall image that is achieved here is the head emerging from a lake. And one of the ways that that is also manifested are these, these kind of like rings around the neck, which are supposed to be like ripples in the water. 
So um, the individuality of each mask is really stressed, particularly in the hairstyles. Um, you'll see in this image that there's this very elaborate coiffure that has been achieved on the figure. Oftentimes um, within the Mende society, um, hairstyle was, is associated with status. So if you can afford to have somebody fix your hair in a very elaborate way, that typically um, indicates that you are a person of means in society. So here's an example of a couple of um, hairstyles that are somewhat similar to the one that we have on the previous slide. Um, you can see again these very elaborate kind of symmetrical coiffers um, and the hairstyles are, are limitless in terms of their possibilities. We can see a couple of other um, manifestations here as well. So um, Bundu helmet masks are also associated with initiation into the Sande society, which is one of two educational societies that are segregated by gender that a person can join within the Mende community. The other is called Poro, and it's exclusively for men. So these societies are intended to sort of be like a finishing school. They teach community expectations and what a person should aspire to be as a woman or a man within the Mende community. There's also a lot of, specifically within the, um, the Sande Society, there's an emphasis on medicine and health, which is always interesting. An additional feature of these masks is the use of the color black. In this particular case, black is used to represent like a coolness, like something that is um, cold. Um, also associated with water, which it makes sense because Soe is a water spirit and humanity as well. When you look at the facial features of these masks, you'll also notice that there's a lot of distortion. Um, for example, the forehead is extremely large and the head is somewhat pointed. So this is, again, so a sort of hierarchical decision on the artist's part to emphasize the size of the head, which is, again, the seed of knowledge. If you have a larger head, you are considered more wise and intelligent. Interestingly, the eyes and mouth are closed. Again, this is associated with modesty, and the ears are very small. Um, within this particular community, having a small mouth is basically like a speak no evil sort of affiliation, so you're not gossiping about your neighbors. And the ears are small so that you can't hear gossip from your neighbors. So these are, are signs of modesty, and they tie back to this concept of the Sunday society where there are expectations in your community of how you should behave. And one of the those hallmark behaviors is don't gossip about your neighbors. This is an Ikenga or shrine figure from the Igbo people of Nigeria. So the Igbo people are a very large and somewhat spread out community of around 8 million people to this day. So when I say Igbo, I'm talking about a very general community of people. And there's actually um, several different sort of like cultures and ethnicities within the Igbo diaspora. So with this particular work is referred to as an ikenga. It's one of the more famous Igbo forms of art. So ikenga literally translates to strong right arm. Um, a right arm is seen as the, the primary tool of utility and of agency for men in Igbo culture. So you can imagine that, of course, the right hand is something that is holding a tool or a weapon. It is indicating one's intent to speak, like raising your hand, and also the hand that is conducting sacrifices and rituals. Um, this very much ties into one of the, the more broad kind of like generalizations about Igbo society, which it kind of focuses less on a chiefdom or a kingdom. There's not really like an organized um, like class system or government in most kind of facets of, of Igbo life. Rather, one's position in society is determined by their individual achievements and merit. So one of the ways that a person can indicate their achievements and can demonstrate to others about all the cool things that they've done is, is through their ikenga. So typically, the larger and more elaborate an ikenga is, the more powerful and prestigious a person is. 
So um, these are also symbols of strength and masculinity in their creation. They're made of a very difficult to work hardwood that requires a lot of strength to carve, um, which is an indication of one's physical might. Um, when you look at the figures themselves, they have this very upright and rigid posture. Oftentimes they have um, arms that are bearing weapons. And then one of the most identifiable features, of course, are these protruding horns that are coming off the top of the head that take up a considerable um, portion of the height of the figure. So almost all Ikenga have horns, and horns in this particular case are associated with rams who are aggressive and have horns and then fight with their heads, which usually ideally results in positive outcomes because when you use your head, you are using your knowledge. So um, oftentimes, in order for any Kenga to be recognized um, by its community or to be considered legitimate, it needs to be consecrated um, before it's used. So what that means is that there, the, the Ikenga is usually like imbibed with certain oils um, or foods, or there could be a sort of um, sacrifice or offering that is made to the statue. These are usually kept in certain areas of the house to receive daily offerings. So they are something that is, that is considered a, a vessel of power throughout a person's lifetime. So um, in some Igbo communities, when the owner of the Akenka dies, the figure is destroyed because the person's physical body is no longer there. But in some communities within the Igbo world, um, the figures are passed down from father to son. This next piece is from the Luba people who currently resi reside in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, this is a Lukasa or memory board. So the primary function of this sort of object is to help the user remember and demonstrate key elements of a narrative. So that could be culture heroes, it could be relationships between people and places, it could be migration patterns, um, ancestral lineages, um, it could be dynasties. There's a lot of different in kinds of information that can manifest in a Lucasa or memory board. The board is essentially a mnemonic device. It is helping the person who holds this knowledge to recall these certain elements of the narrative or to draw connections between the elements of a narrative. Remember that most of these communities that are covered in this part of the curriculum do not have written languages. So information has to be communicated in different ways. And one of the ways that information is communicated in this case is through a, um, a, a visual sort of cartography. So there are specific members of, of these communities that are able to read and interpret these boards. It's not like every um, person within the Luba community can look at this board and be able to tell what's going on. So there are specific members of the community, they're known as the Mbuchia Society, that reserve the ability to read and interpret the memory boards. They also have the responsibility in the community to communicate these important narratives to the rest of the people. They are also like the designated philosophers of the people. Not only are they using these kinds of objects to tell the stories of the past, but they use these narrations to um, interpret current events and contemporary situations and to make judgments as to what they can do. There's also diviners within the community that can use the Lucasa to predict kind of like future plans and future events. So these items are relatively simple in their construction. They are a piece of wood that is adorned with several dozen or even several hundred pegs that hold these little beads in place. So the beads each can mean different things. As I mentioned previously, it could be representing a specific individual or a place and so on and so forth. Um, and a person who knows this board intimately would be able to tell you what each of these beads means. So these boards are considered very important objects. They are regarded as kind of like these divine revelations and divine histories that are manifesting in the corporeal world. These, re these are not just kind of like an average book or, or something that is purely a tool. It is an object that is a vessel for sacred knowledge. An additional design element that you should be aware of 
regarding the leucosa are the zoomorphic elements of the patterning on the sides. So we have this sort of hatching pattern on the sides right here with the use of triangles. Um, these are associated with the crocodile, which is an animal that occupies both the land and the water rather comfortably. This represents the two interdepend interdependent leaders of Luba politics. Um, interestingly, there's this sort of balance of power that is happening between the Mumbuji society, who are the ones who are telling the histories and advising on future plans of action, and then the Kaloba or the chief, who is the primary landowner. So they sort of balance each other out, and that is represented in the design motif of this sort of like crocodile scales on the side. They are working together. Our final piece of the day is the Aka elephant mask produced by the Bamaleki people of what is now called Cameroon. These particular masks are worn at the royal court. They are only owned and worn by members of the Kuosi society. So this is a society that includes royalty, elite warriors, and landowners. So there's a lot of kind of indicators in these kinds of objects that would denote them as being high status. Um, for one thing, it's a little bit difficult to see in this image, but this is composed entirely of beadwork. So you might recall the bandolier bag from the Indigenous Americas curriculum where you had these um, geometric motifs that were created using beads that were sewn onto a piece of fabric, or in that case it was leather. We have a similar method being used here where you have these um, very small beads, usually made of glass, that have been imported um, from areas of northern Africa. There's a lot of um, beads that trace their provenance back to the northern Mediterranean even. And these beads were very expensive to produce and then also to get them thousands of miles south into these communities. So beads were oftentimes regarded as an object of prestige and they were reserved solely for members of higher society. You can also imagine too that the amount of work that is going into the creation of any one of these masks is also going to make them fairly exclusive because they're very expensive to produce. So these sorts of masks are worn on special ceremonial occasions, oftentimes accompanied by these elaborate headdresses and costumes. So here is a contextual image to give you a sense of what that looks like. There is oftentimes a sort of hat that goes on top that is decorated with red and gray feathers from parrots. It's a very loud and ostentatious spectacle involving the brandishing of horsetails and spears and then banging of drums and gongs. Basically, people are demonstrating how much power and wealth that they have. The way that these masks are worn is that there's the top is sort of like a, a thimble and it is worn over the face and over the top of the head like a ski mask. Um, and there's of course some um, holes for the eyes and then one part of the the flap kind of drapes down along the, the person's torso and then there's another flap that goes down the person's back. The overall motif that is achieved is the elephant. So you can see the two round discs on the side that look like elephant ears, and then this scarf-like element coming down in the front and in the back is supposed to look like a trunk. So we have these sort of zoomorphic elements that are making their way into this kinds of mask. Um, more subtly are these um, jagged patterns here, um, which are typically associated with the, um, the kinds of patterns that you would see on jaguars. And a lot of these um, individuals that are in this contextual image, I think this is a jaguar pelt right here, or a leopard pelt. So these are two animals that are affiliated with power and royalty. You can imagine, of course, elephants are very large and they can wield their weight around in quite sublime ways. And then, of course, you have um, leopards, which are very prolific hunters and apex predators. So you can imagine why these two animals are associated with power and royalty.